This is the last session, uh, but very important in Eastern Europe, uh, where this uh, conference is taking place. Um, and it's on a very important topic. Uh, ever since its release, uh, the EU taxonomy has attracted uh, massive interest, but also controversy. The EU taxonomy is in tended to provide clarity on environmental sustainability and, and to investors, to financial institutions and companies enable informed decisions, um, informed decision making, and uh, to foster investments in environmental sustain, environmentally sustainable activities. In, it is the world's first green uh, list for sustainable investment. Perhaps that's, that is why it is uh, also so controversial. Um, the, but taxonomy is not just a science exercise. It's also highly politically and economically sensitive. There is a lack of debate among politicians and environmentalists over energy security in the short to medium term and over how much it, uh, how much it will cost to consumers. Hopefully, the discussions today will add to this debate. Um, we need to get it right. And we have the right people with us. We have Andreas Good, uh, Policy Director of Eurogas, based in Brussels. Hans uh, Kreisel, Chairman, GEOTE, -E, uh, again based in Brussels. And Dr. Theodor Terzopoulos, Coordinate Director of Strategy and Corporate Affairs of Deda Greece. I will give the floor first to Andreas. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody uh, watching us online. Uh, so I'm here today to, um, to talk to you about how we see the role of gas in, uh, in reaching the net zero carbon objective by 2050, and in particular how the sustainable finance rules fit into uh, this picture. I think in order to frame the discussion, it's quite useful to give a short overview about how we see the role of gas evolve over the next 30 odd years or so. So uh, I'll briefly touch upon the question of why is gas uh, important for the transition? Uh, what kind of technologies do we actually need uh, from our perspective? And what is necessary in order to scale the market? And the findings that I will present are largely based on uh, a study that Eurogas has carried out in 2020 that looked at what is the most cost-effective pathway to reach EU climate objectives. And I'll be pass a, a second to introduce Eurogas before I begin with the main presentation. So uh, for those less familiar with Eurogas, we represent the mid and downstream part of the gas value chain in Europe. And this includes, of course, traders, gas retailers, and distribution companies. Uh, so that's just Eurogas in a nutshell. Um, now let me dive into the, uh, the results of a study. The key takeaways that I will present are the following. Uh, gas is essential for a cost-effective energy transition. Uh, we need all types of gases and all types of technologies in order to deliver the EU climate objective. And uh, we also need to rely on gaseous technology in in every sector. Now, I won't go into detail uh, for all sectors, but I'll briefly touch on power and heating, where I think um, the discussion uh, about taxonomy is actually quite relevant. Now, uh, with regard to cost efficiency, um, we have compared two scenarios in our study. One uh, that is primarily electrification driven, that's close to the European Commission scenario, and another one that is more balanced in its approach. Uh, it doesn't exclusively rely or it doesn't so heavily rely on electrification to meet EU targets. And it indeed foresees an important and actually growing role for gaseous energy towards 2050. Importantly here is that both scenarios achieve and are fully compatible uh, with the EU climate objectives to fully decarbonize by 2050. Uh, but relevantly here, uh, the more balanced scenario that Eurogas has developed actually managed to save over 4 trillion euros over the next 30 years while achieving the same objective. Now, 
On this slide, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the time to really go into detail um, of, uh, of the ins and outs of the study, but I think this is really a good example of where we see cost saving potential of a more balanced approach. Because one of the biggest savings that, uh, um, that can be achieved is by lowering the investment needs in uh, expanding electricity infrastructure that would be needed uh, in, for instance, the heating sector if we primarily electrify heating. Of course, there are regional differences in, in Europe um, and in different countries, but um, uh, by and large across Europe, this is uh, a very significant impact, accounting to about 1.3 trillion euros of the total savings that we see. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to, to conclude on this, so we clearly see that uh, a balanced approach that relies on all technologies is, is delivering a more cost efficient, um, cost efficient transition. And this is also where it links to the taxonomy because we need to make sure that we avoid a situation where the sustainable finance rules of the taxonomy regulation uh, well, provide the wrong investment signals to the market that guide to uh, inefficient uh, investments uh, on a, on a uh, European level. And uh, I also mentioned earlier that it's, it's not enough to only look at renewable gases or renewable technologies and consider those sustainable. Our study clearly shows that we need all the different options in order to meet our targets. Uh, again, here, I won't dive into detail and I'll just mention very briefly that um, so despite of so what some might think or like to think uh, decarbonized gas system by 2050, uh, from our perspective, doesn't mean the end of natural gas. Um, of course, natural gas consumption will be declining to 2050, but it will far from disappear. And secondly, natural gas will also be important to allow us to actually produce the necessary volumes of, uh, of hydrogen that we need in order to, um, to achieve the transition. And thirdly, um, hydrogen from renewable sources, renewable electricity, will eventually become the dominant source of hydrogen in the market. But that is only happening towards the end uh, of the transition period, so towards 2050. Um, in, the, in the meantime, clearly all the different options are absolutely relevant. And very briefly here as well, on the final point, uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, all the scenarios that we have looked at tell us one story is that carbon capture is, is not an option. It's a necessity. So these are some of the very fundamental aspects that future taxonomy rules need to take into account. Because if we remove the possibility uh, for these technologies to be financed or to be considered as sustainable investments, then it means that we undermine the chance of first of all, of succeeding in the energy transition, but uh, in particular, we risk significantly increasing the cost of a transition that will already be expensive. So this is really, really key here. We need the taxonomy rules that allow all technologies to contribute. And uh, in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll quickly skip through the following graphs um, and we can come back to the points in, in the discussion. Um, but of course, it's, it's quite relevant to mention that from our perspective, of course, gas will be essential in power generation in the transition. Uh, it will be essential initially to, to phase out coal and oil, um, um, and it will also be essential to balance the power grid that will increasingly be dominated by variable renewable generation. Uh, so it has an important role to, to provide also security of supply. All these things were mentioned um, already today, so I won't discuss it at length, but. Uh, we need to make sure then that the future taxonomy rules take this into account. And for this, we need realistic thresholds in, in gas power generation that can actually be achieved by best in class technology that is available today. And as the rules currently stand, or as, as the discussion goes, um, there seems to be a de facto exclusion of, of such technologies. And this is clearly something where much more work is necessary to create workable, um, a workable framework. And uh, very briefly here as well, uh, something that isn't taken into account in the current sustainable finance framework is the role of blending, um, blending hydrogen into the existing uh, natural gas infrastructure, which we believe at least initially during the transition period 
is absolutely fundamental if we want to create a market for hydrogen. And the current rules as they stand, again, do not provide any indication as to uh, the sustainability aspect of such operation. And uh, I'll leave it with this and happy to pick up some of the points during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andreas, for an excellent presentation. It uh, opens us, open us up uh, many questions, which I hope to follow up later on during the discussion. Let's now pass the floor to Hans Kreisel, chairman of GEOD. Um, perhaps you can also tell us what the organization stands for and what it does before the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I will. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Andreas, for, for the very good presentation. Uh, truly astonishing numbers, of course, that you can't really um, talk around. They are, they are facts. Yes, Geode is uh, one of the four DSO organizations in Brussels. Brussels. And in my normal day's work, uh, I'm CEO of... Uh, uh, Nordion Energy, which is uh, both electricity and gas TSO company, but also the Swedish gas TSO uh, company. And um, as I said, uh, this topic is, of course, uh, very dear to me. And, uh, you know, we're living in uh, the most fantastic uh, times right now when it, when it comes to the energy market with a huge transition. Uh, the, the world has aligned around uh, the idea of um, decarbonizing uh, everything <clears throat> and that goes for for the member states that goes for the industry for the transport sectors for the commun consumers um, but also from uh, uh, the european union uh, so the european union has basically over the last decades been focusing on electricity uh, I'm going to start off with uh, some of the big numbers just to, to show you the challenge that the EU stands before. And then I'm going to go to talk a bit on the, on the taxonomy um, issues and give uh, three uh, takeaways for the Commission in, uh, around, surrounding the, the taxonomy here. But basically, to, to give you a, a picture of the challenge uh, that the European Union stands before, and, and that is, um, as I said, we've been working with the electricity side over the last decades. Uh, electricity in the European energy system represents around two and a half thousand terawatt hours. Whereof, over, over the last decades, we have achieved to, to um, convert around eight between eight and nine hundred terawatt hours to renewable uh, energy has been a good work but with the the green deal package from the european union we are now focusing on getting net zero until 2050 and becoming net zero to 2050 means addressing the four thousand terawatt hours of uh, natural gas the 6,000 terawatt hours of oil and the 2,500 terawatt hours of coal, mounting to a, a 12,500 terawatt hours. And you compare that to the 2,500 terawatt hours of electricity, that gives you the enormous challenge. Uh, hydrogen has become some sort of uh, the savior uh, here right, right now. And I, I'm totally pro everything. I'm pro the development of, of uh, of uh, the transition and everything but one has to put uh, the challenge into perspective but it's not hard to understand why the european union is focusing a lot uh, on uh, the energy sector uh, we the energy sector we represent around 22 percent of the direct greenhouse gases emission uh, here but if you also take into account the, the energy that is used by other sectors, we represent 75% of the greenhouse ga gas emissions. So, so, you're, uh, so it's not that hard to understand why uh, the European Union is focusing on, on our side of the, uh, of the energy uh, business. One of the instruments is the taxonomy. And just for you all to, all to understand what the taxonomy is, is it's actually not more than a, a basic a framework to to um, to uh, qualify till what 
degree a certain economic activity or an investment is uh, environmentally sustainable. And um, to its help, the Commission is setting up the different the technical screening criteria. And though we represent such a big part of, of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, there's a lot of uh, technical screening uh, uh, criteria on the, on the energy business. But I mean, uh, the, the European Union, they, they're not, they don't, of course, think that um, uh, economic activities are the only things that will uh, green the energy systems. They understand that they are just a part of that greening process, a very, very important part, uh, though. So when setting up the, the, um, uh, the taxonomy and the, and the criteria on how to get to a cleaner investment in, uh, in Europe, they've set out four basic uh, qualifying activities, uh, so to say. And they are very, very general. I mean, basically, you should contribute to system is, is substantially to one of the environmental criteria. You should do no significant harm to the environment. And you should have some uh, of the minimum social safeguards. And then you should live up to these uh, screening criteria. Uh, what we are lacking in that, um, among those activities, is basically we don't take into account um, the, the road ahead, the way to get to the target. So we are focusing a lot on get on the target, but not getting to the target. But to realize this, of course, it's up to the participants of the system. This taxonomy won't actually uh, enforce things. Uh, it will just uh, I think if, for the EIB, of course, it will be important and for uh, the funding from the European Union. And you know that you, it has been thousand billion euros allocated to, uh, to, the, uh, to the transition, climate transition. And of course, but a lot of that will come from private investors. And some of it will come, will come from the European funds. But then, as I said, they've set up the tra taxonom taxonomy. It was on public consultation until December. They got 45,000 answers saying, help, uh, th th this won't uh, f fly. And I took a lot of them into consideration. And we got to see a draft uh, of it all where they took some very good measurements. So for, for example, saying that you should have a gas transition uh, time. But then they, they basically bailed out and um, put forward a proposal f for the, f the final uh, document that we saw uh, four days, four or five days ago, something like that, uh, to separate uh, the proposals for gas and nuclear and other transition activities until Q4 this year. Uh, we from the gas industry, we, uh, we uh, greeted that uh, um, change, giving it a bit more time to talk about uh, the road ahead, how to get to the targets in uh, 2050. Um, but someone, uh, a couple of people are, of, of course, accusing uh, the Commission for just not being brave enough to take on the NGOs. That is, uh, of course, uh, criticizing everything that is not uh, total end state or totally, uh, totally green. So from my side, but also from uh, the organization's side, we have basically three things that we would like to see from the Commission during this period going forward and setting um, a, a final view on, on, gas, on the gas side. One is, uh, number one is very easy, of course, it's uh, is that we should have evidence-based and transparent criteria for, for, um, uh, for evaluating uh, what is actually uh, uh, environmentally uh, good. But the second one is the need of taking into account the development of the energy systems all the way to uh, 
2050 because we can't really think that the today system is the end state of technology and business models and everything that is needed to get it to 2050. And we have to enable uh, investors to take the risk on investing right now in the technologies that are uh, that we can see right now. Uh, giving the investors the possibility to invest in the technologies that are a bit uh, risky. Uh, I think it's only that way we can get to the uh, some sort of stable pathway uh, to, uh, towards 2050. Also achieving the learn curves that are incredibly important to get a, a, a hydrogen system going because hydrogen is incredibly expensive today. But everyone is talking about the, the learn curves will pressure the, uh, the prices and that's why we are going to uh, achieve the, the results that we want to do. But someone has to pay for that and those investors, pension funds, uh, state-owned companies, all of those, they need some sort of stability uh, in, in going forward uh, here. I'll just give you one very simple example and that is network stability on the electricity side. So when we are ch changing fuel-based uh, power generation over to weather-based power generation, we, s we lose stability in the network. So we will need some sort of controllable power generation over a foreseeable time period until we can get stability or structure or from hydrogen or, or, or bio biomethane or, or the CCS or, or, or whatever over the time. Very important. The third is uh, actually don't look away from uh, the existing technologies that are good to decarbonize uh, all sectors of the economy. Don't look away from the de technologies that could give us a quick decarbonization of uh, certain industries, the chemical, petrochemical, steel industries, uh, for example. And that could be CCS or CCUS technologies. Uh, they have to be treated uh, just in the same way as we do with um, other green solutions. We shouldn't let uh, the best be enemy of the good here, but using everything. So to, to sum this up, I think that what we should send to the Commission now and the work uh, going on uh, in order to secure a cost-efficient pathway all the way to 2050 is actually to acknowledge not only long-term renewables uh, but also decarbonized uh, uh, gases, uh, other low-carbon uh, solutions that we have, but also the transitional role of natural gas in the system. I think if we don't do that, we will never reach the, our targets for 2050. Thank you. I think you're muted. I am. Thanks, Hans. Uh, excellent presentation. I fully agree with your last conclusion. It's something we, we need to discuss later on a bit, a bit more. Um, very valid points. Let's now go to our last presenter for this session, uh, Theodor uh, Trezobulos, the coordinating director of strategy, strategy and corporate affairs of DEDA Greece. Theodor, can you also tell us what DEDA is uh, doing in Greece before you go into the presentation? All right, thank you, Charles. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. great. Uh, DEDA is one of the four uh, distribution, distribution operators of the country, uh, but practically uh, is uh, the activities, the activities of DEDA are extended in the most, the larger part of the country. Uh, is a newly established uh, company. Uh, we start. Uh, we, 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 we were established in uh, 2017, four years ago, and uh, we are trying to uh, proceed with probably the most um, gr the greater uh, extension um, project of uh, distribution uh, networks in Europe. Uh, the amount of uh, these projects are 
uh, rises to uh, 150 million uh, euros. And uh, we are very confident that uh, it will be for the benefit of the society, local societies, and uh, to the benefit of the uh, national economy. Okay, this is as an introduction. Uh, now, uh, coming back, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me start uh, by um, uh, some uh, introductory remarks uh, on my presentation. Uh, first of all, I think that the EU aims to fully decarbonize its economy, requiring a complete overhaul of the energy system and its infrastructure by uh, 2050. Uh, the Green Deal aims to achieve at least 55% reduction of, uh, on, uh, in uh, greenhouse uh, greenhouses gas emissions by the 2030. Raising the ambitions of EU climate policy will require significant investment in energy efficiency, renewable energy, new uh, low-carbon technologies and grid, invest, uh, grid uh, infrastructure. Within this framework, energy infrastructure operators and energy producer, uh, producer must deliver to European consumers and the European economy a new energy system that should be green and clean, affordable and available, secure and reliable. Combined with the existing gas infrastructure, uh, renewable and low-carbon gases uh, can help to achieve the transition to a net-zero energy system at the lowest uh, societal uh, costs. Given the production uh, of renewable, um, given that the production of renewable gases uh, is becoming cheaper and cheaper, greening uh, gas uh, infrastructure is a key issue ensuring a financial successful and smoother transition to the new energy era. Uh, let me finish this uh, introduction by stating that um, uh, um, the new energy environment uh, dictates integration of electricity and gas sectors in their respective, in their respective infrastructure, as uh, electrification will certainly play an important role in the energy transition, but as argued uh, by uh, the International Energy Agency, greening the gas infrastructure is more than uh, critical. Green the grass infrastructure mean, uh, includes uh, all those actions and investments uh, that DSOs and DSOs must undertake in order to, first, in the beginning, safely distribute blends of natural gas, biomethane and hydrogen, and then mixtures of biomethane and uh, hydrogen only. Second, minimize additional costs and disruption for existing customers, residential, commercial, uh, and industrial. And third, maximize, I would say, uh, said, uh, make perpetual gas infrastructure's lifetime. I said uh, the said approach, to my mind, and probably not only, is the most cost efficient way to achieve net zero and green transition targets through the implementation of well balanced strategies on uh, the use of renewable gases and their mixtures. This is because the value of the existing gas infrastructure, uh, the distribution and transmission infrastructure in Europe is extremely high, and no effort to, to, trans, uh, to transition to new energy environment is uh, financially viable without including their continuous use. Uh, in Greece only, during the last 25 years, more than 1,000 kilometers transmission and more than 6,000 kilometers of distribution grids have been constructed, expected to be uh, fully amortized uh, beyond the year 2050. Um, in the near future, we believe that biomethane is expected to further scale up. Uh, blue and hydrogen uh, and green hydrogen are expected to further develop to accelerate scale up uh, st starting uh, in the mid 2020s. International Energy uh, Agency stated uh, that biomethane is the largest contributor of low carbon gas supply in the uh, time horizon of the world energy output scenarios. Biomethane, therefore, has an equally important role to play in the creation of a truly circular economy as it does in the energy transition, and to achieve net zero, we will need both. 
Biomethane uh, uh, use uh, is uh, considered as uh, carbon neutral uh, in terms of CO2 uh, release, as released CO2 from an anaerobic digestion is called biogenic uh, CO2. Anaerobic digestion is a ready to use technology which produces biogas and digest uh, uh, from a series of biological uh, processes in which my, my, my organisms uh, break down organic uh, feedstock uh, in a digester in absence of oxygen. In other words, biomethane is generated by recycling organic waste. As far as the uh, other producing processes are concerned, because of the time limitation in this presentation, I have only to mention that uh, gasification is a less mature technology, but is able to produce biomethane at a larger scale uh, and at uh, higher pressures, and is expect expected to further scale up starting mid of the 2020s. Uh, hydrothermal process uh, represents a way to store renewable electricity surplus in gaseous uh, form. Uh, 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 in this process, electricity surplus is used uh, for electrolysis, whereas uh, water and, uh, uh, is hydrolyzed to create hydrogen. Almost 12% of biogas produced in Europe was upgraded to biomethane in uh, the anaerobic digestion production process in uh, 2018. Let's back to a synopsis of the current situation in matter in Greece. Although, Greece, uh, although in Greece there are few biogas plants, as you can see on the map, uh, there are no biomethane plants. Uh, sorry, biogas plants existing, is exi are existing, not uh, biomethane plants. Last year, my company, Deta, one, uh, as I said, one of the uh, four uh, natural gas distribution operators of the country, considered the injection of biomethane as an immediate and fundamental strategic target. Since then, DEDA appointed the Center for Renewable Energy Sources to carry, on, uh, carry out an inquiry related to the determination of the potential of biomethane production from biomass in the areas where DEDA owns and operates gas distribution networks. The first results of uh, the said inquiry concerning the uh, region of Eastern Macedonia th and Thrace are uh, shown in this uh, table. Uh, please note at the bottom of the right uh, column uh, that the amount, uh, um, the potential amount of biomethane production in that uh, region uh, goes to 700,000 um, megawatt hours per hour. And the relationship between this uh, biomethane pot potential production and the medium long term gas demand in the area is shown in this table. Uh, uh, please note that uh, in, on this table, quite high shares of demand can be provided for by the biomethane potentially productive, produced in all prefecture of Eastern Macedonian Thrace region. The reported shares uh, are related to the best case scenario of the sensitivity analysis, where those of the worst case scenario are 40% uh, less. Combining the biomethane pot potential uh, production to the medium long term demand in every prefecture of the region, a valuable tool is provided for first, locating the proper place to install the, a biomethane production unit. Second, determining uh, the, the, the correct capacity of the production unit. And third, determining the most financially uh, affordable way for connecting the unit to the nearest uh, gas networks. For example, in the way the area of Kavala is the third, second uh, uh, line, uh, the installation of a single one megawatt uh, biomethane plant seems enough to fully meet the demand uh, for the years to come. The inquiry is now extended to the region of Central Macedonia and Central Greece, while the outcomes of, uh, are expected uh, by the end of September. Uh, until then, uh, uh, that acts as a prime mover, uh, proposing all necessary regulatory and legislative uh, reviews required, like 
drafting uh, a proposal to the regulator about the code for the connection of biomethane pr production units to the national uh, gas networks and uh, drafting proposals to the competent authorities related to the guaranteed price mechanism feeding uh, the so uh, called feeding tariffs and the methodology for issuing the certificates of origin and other related legislative issues. Hydrogen. Hydrogen has enjoyed uh, unrivaled attention both by media and a European Commission's plan, uh, plans to achieve uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. To begin with, hydrogen must be considered as an energy carrier, not as an energy source, meaning that it needs a primary source of energy to be produced solar, uh, electricity, hydro, nuclear power, or gas, or any other fossil fuel. According to the specifics of the production process, including the energy source it utilizes, hydrogen is dubbed as yellow, pink, uh, pink, blue, gray, and uh, green, in fact. Almost all hydrogen uh, in Europe is currently produced in gray, um, by gray hydrogen production routes. Green and blue hydrogen production routes are only in an early commercial stage, less than 1% of uh, the European uh, Union hydrogen production. The European Union's uh, decarbonization strategy mostly excludes natural gas used for, for uh, blue hydrogen production and largely focus on green hydrogen produced through uh, electro uh, electrolysis fuel uh, uh, by renewable electricity. Uh, Ah, really? We need a conclusion. One minute. Uh, all right, then uh, I pass uh, probably uh, straight forward to um, the synopsis of uh, the current situation about the hydrogen uh, situation in Greece. Uh, as, uh, other, uh, as other um, uh, speakers said uh, before, uh, currently there is no green uh, hydrogen production in Greece. The best known proposal for green hydrogen production is the White Dragon project uh, consisting of 1.15 uh, uh, gigawatt, uh, gigawatt uh, photovoltaic power generation, 670 megawatts electrolysis uh, unit, and 400 gigawatt hours uh, hydrogen storage unit. As far as the gas infrastructure operator are concerned, DEDA has included uh, the distribution of uh, hydrogen in, the, in its strategic target together with biomethane. This data uh, by the end of June will receive the results of an inquiry carried out by a consultant about the ability of its network to distribute blends of hydrogen and natural gas, while in September the results on the standards to be followed for the conclusion for the construction of new pure hydrogen distribution networks. Uh, are expected. Uh, this is all from my part. Thank you. Thank you, Theodore. Uh, very impressive to see what is happening in Greece in terms of greening uh, energy. Um, pleased to hear that. Let's go into discussion. So I would like to address the first question to Andreas. Finding the right balance between what is considered to be green and what is not is critical to achieving a successful energy transition in Europe. And I know that Europe, Eurogas is battling that. Are you winning the battle in Brussels, especially on the future of natural gas? I'm winning the battle in Brussels. Um, I think it's, a, it's not really a, a question of, a, I wouldn't describe it that way. Um, but it, it's it's absolutely essential that uh, we we manage to uh, bring some pragmatism into the debate yeah. um, because it's because of the speed of the transition that is required. We don't really have the luxury to exclusively focus on renewable energy. If we had uh, another hundred years. Uh, to achieve targets, that might be an option. But considering the scale of the magnitude and the speed with which progress must be achieved, we really need to put all options on the table. And this requires a pragmatic approach. Uh, and this also translates or should translate into the discussion on the sustainable finance rule, where we really shouldn't, uh, and I think uh, Hans has, has quite nicely uh, put it with throwing um, the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we, we shouldn't rule out any technologies that I think most of us, at least here, are on the table and um, on the virtual table, and probably also a big chunk of the audience 
uh, absolutely convinced are essential for meeting our objectives. You said uh, it's not a battle, but uh, only about two years ago, I, I was at a conference in, um, I think it was in Paris, and, uh, and uh, Klaus Dietrich Borchardt uh, came and said, come and do something. All these NGOs in Brussels are killing us. You're not making your case. You're there and I hope you're making the case. Anyway, let, let me ask Hans a question on, on funding. Based on everything we said, should EIP rethink its funding role? So, oh, I'm with you again. Yeah, well, yeah, I think they've they've actually took on a, taken on a, a very uh, forward leaning approach over the last decades and going into project risks and things of, like that. I think they they made a tremendous job when it came to uh, support uh, the ba battery development um, uh, after clean energy after the clean energy package. So I think the EIB is doing a good job, uh, but I think that everything right now boils down to uh, not only talking about the end state, uh, how it looks uh, in a, a dream world. I don't want to be sarcastic about that because I, I really support the, the transition. But we do have to acknowledge that we will have to take some good steps. Yeah. Uh, right now to get forward in decarbonizing, uh, decarbonizing certain sectors and things like that and then we'll have to use ccs we'll have to to enhance the biomethane uh, uh, production we will have to make fuel switch from coal to to gas and that has to be acknowledged as well by both the taxonomy and with the with the eu and the eib so that you support that sort of uh, money. But I, I must also say that, I mean, my company, we're financed with pension funds from, from uh, different countries in Europe, and uh, they are risk avert, but cheap. So uh, as long as you can, you can create a stable world of uh, income over the time, you can attract other capital, other financing than, than EIB. So uh, I, I think that uh, the, the basics lies in creating a stable transition that is foreseeable for us investors in the, in the business. Yes, that's true. Uh, but there are also war, I mean, just to go on from there on funding, there are also warnings that if ta taxonomy stops funding from Western financial institutions, Central and Eastern European project developers may go for loans from the Chinese banks. Yeah, Chinese but banks or Japanese Chinese banks. banks. Um, yeah. What are your views? I mean, should should Chinese banks replace? Um, no, I think that uh, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Uh, for Sweden, we made uh, a study on what would the transition cost. It will cost 150 billion euros. And, and uh, when we looked into what is the value for Sweden if we do this with our own industry, with our own people and things like that, the value for Sweden was 600 billion euros. And I think if Europe wants to do this transition in a way where we come out on top, we should use the European industry to do the transition, European financing uh, institutions, we should we should have we should promote the European industry while doing that and enhancing the 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 competitiveness uh, globally for the European industries. So I think that that's that's why we should focus on uh, attracting European money uh, to this project because that creates value. Yeah, that's what you're talking about, and I fully agree. Theodore, uh, by when do you expect biomethane and hydrogen to become significant energy players in Greece? You are muted. All right. We have okay. Um, the the first results of the inquiry we carried out. Uh, are very pro uh, promising. 
Uh, so I think that uh, it would be uh, very easy from uh, uh, the year to come, I mean next year, uh, for investors to get to be interested in this uh, uh, energy production. And uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, the installation of a biomethane uh, production unit uh, is uh, a fast, let's say, project, I suppose that by the end of uh, uh, 2022, uh, biomethane could run in uh, our uh, networks. Okay, thank you. And um, we have just a, a few more minutes, so let's uh, have a, a couple of other questions. Um, Andreas, is there a danger that taxonomy could create barriers instead of incentivizing business with their energy transition projects? How can we avoid that? Yeah, I think we have the risk of, of repeating myself. Um, there clearly is a, is a risk um, that the taxonomy rules, as they're written now, create those barriers. Because eventually, um, I think it was mentioned before, I mean, while the rules are in a way voluntary, that they're not binding uh, investors, it will send a clear signal. And we also think that the rules will influence quite significantly future legislative developments that will be binding. So it's really important that we get the current system right because it will have a wider impact beyond sustainable finance. And so it, it is really essential that technologies, and, and here we've mentioned it before, coal to gas uh, switching, oil to gas switching, all of these technologies that currently aren't covered are provided for in the future uh, delegated act that we hope to see in the last quarter of this year. Okay, that's good, thank you. And, and, and related to this, Hans, um, in Germany, a study concluded that only 1% of blue chip companies listed on the dark stock exchange would be considered sustainable if the uh, taxonomy draft uh, is applied in its current form. And the percent, percentage, rise, percentage rises to 2% in the French CAC 40 and the Eurostox 50 indices. And this has led to warnings that uh, the taxonomy could end up generating an unsustainable green bubble detached from fundamental data and reality. How should this be addressed? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're right. I mean, in order for the taxonomy to be effective, uh, it hangs on the on the uptake of the of the market participants, of course, and if if they can't really identify with the, the development they they will not choose the path uh, of acknowledging the taxonomy and they will do their investments anyway and follow their own path to uh, climate neutrality so uh, i think that f for the taxonomy to make itself relevant to the companies they will have to also be um, in in sync with time so to say but with that said, I, I, this doesn't surprise me at all. And I think that that could also be okay because we have a, we have a far way to go. As I started off with the, the two and a half thousand or the eight to nine hundred terawatt hours of renewable electricity uh, and in, in, in comparison to the 12,500 terawatt hours of fossil fuel in the system, of, of course, we haven't come that far, and that, that that just shows us how 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 steep the way is up for the mountain uh, right now. So that's why I think that uh, one, one should urge everyone to 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 try to view everything clearly and take the the the, the wise and good steps uh, forward right now. Um, we shouldn't let go of the target. We should really acknowledge the target, but take the right wise steps forward. Uh, the, com the coming 10 years and then the next 10 years and then the next 10 years. Well, I hope uh, NGOs in Brussels can uh, can live with that, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> no, and uh, you know, and the ten the field, the tension field, uh, that's okay. I mean, they should take on that posi position. They should push us 
from the energy business. I mean, our track record isn't the best one. We've yeah. been focusing on security of supply, building up societies over many years, uh, supporting industries uh, and things. And then, now there's a new ball game. Uh, we need the tension. So that's that's yeah, that's just fine. But so I don't have the thing, the thinking that I can convince them. But they have their role. Uh, I want to convince the commission. That's the important thing. And the last question to Theodore. Theodore, Central and Eastern European countries see natural gas as key in terms of replacing coal and lignitin power generation. That includes Greece. Should they, should they be given time and how long? Uh, how long do they need to achieve that transition? Uh, <laughs> Theodore, we can't hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, how long? Uh, for sure, uh, the decarbonization of uh, the power production uh, is foreseen for uh, 2028. Um, uh, this uh, power production uh, should be replaced uh, by uh, natural gas. Um, and uh, so uh, I think that uh, natural gas uh, will play uh, a key role uh, in decarbonizing the power sector. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, it is difficult to make a guess uh, about uh, the rest of uh, uh, the um, sectors uh, due to the fact that uh, the big, big industries are uh, spread uh, all over Greece and so it is very difficult to feed them uh, uh, if we want, to, we want to decarbonize, to feed them with dedicated special hydrogen uh, pipelines. It, it would be a very expensive exercise. Uh, so, uh, I think that uh, biomethane and the, the local production of biomethane in, in, in Greece is uh, uh, the key, uh, the, the right answer. So, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, whatever we have to do is, uh, in order to achieve our targets, is to uh, um, develop uh, the potential uh, production of biomethane in this country, uh, um, uh, push it uh, all uh, the production, not for um, production of, of power, but to the gas uh, networks, and uh, then with, uh, you, by using the CCS uh, technology, which uh, is a very valid technology and which uh, is improving year by year and uh, which becomes uh, less expensive year by year uh, to uh, reduce also or to uh, become, let's say, negative from the point of view of uh, CO2 emissions, because uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, if uh, CCAS is uh, used uh, during the production of biomethane uh, from biomass, then th there is a negative balance uh, of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, that means uh, uh, it is uh, emitted less uh, CO2 than the existing. So this is uh, the, the future of uh, uh, the energy sector in Greece as far as uh, uh, natural gas and uh, coal is uh, concerned. Thank you. Well, I think we had a really good session, good, good presentations, excellent presentations, excellent discussion. Andreas, Hans, Fyodor, thank you for your contributions. I, it's per, probably fair to say that ta taxonomy has uh, some way to go yet before it becomes a, a practical tool. Thank you all. Uh, back to Kostis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all participants of this last session, especially thank to you, Charles, for managing this um, um, session came at the end. Uh, <laughs> we are very delayed, but I think it was a very fruitful discussion. Of course, uh, this is, um, I think uh, as time goes on, we are going to have a better focus 
on what's happening, especially with hydrogen and uh, biomethane. Personally, I'm, I'm not convinced at all that biomethane has a future um, in Greece in the next few years, may maybe 2030 onwards. Um, uh, hydrogen is, is more likely uh, because of production. But again, uh, listening to the um, whole deliberations, I think um, gas is here to stay for some time. Uh, what I can see is that we're going to have stringent um, um, conditions, um, stricter rules and conditions, health and safety, um, and different standards, higher standards. Um, otherwise, uh, decarbonization uh, in our, at least in our region, which are, in, includes about 15 countries, including Turkey, is going to fall flat in its face. So gas is absolutely necessary, but I think, and I think most speakers have pointed towards this direction, uh, we're going to have a different focus from now on. Uh, the taxonomy definitely has helped um, um, energize or activate um, the uh, fine tuning required as we go on. Uh, so uh, I think um, the scene is set for much uh, uh, wider and intense discussion. And in this sense, I very much welcome both um, uh, Geode and um, Eurogas participation in this last session. I think it was an eye opener because we could have a very good uh, um, input from the industry concerned. So uh, it uh, it has uh, brought a lot of reality into this discussion. And with this note, I wish to thank everybody. Uh, what we're going to do from now on, we're going, as usual, to organize the microsite with all the presentations. So I expect before the end of the week, you're going to receive an email with all the presentations uh, in, organized in a, a microsite. So it's a good reference. And um, uh, I look forward to welcome you to one of our next uh, events from September onwards. Uh, we have uh, plenty of things to discuss, especially as we will have completed by then the Outlook, Southeast Europe Energy Outlook, which is a massive work we've been working on the last two years. And there we have very um, interesting projections, uh, demand um, and supply projections, plus a very good sectorial analysis of what's happening in the region. So I wish to thank you, everybody, and have a nice evening, good evening, and see you very soon. Bye-bye from us.